Uh, good morning and good evening uh, to uh, to the panelists and viewers, uh, depending on, uh, on uh, where where you are uh, resting. Uh, my name is Adam Schwartz. I'm uh, currently in Washington D.C., um, so it's uh, evening on on uh, uh, here. Um, I am uh, delighted to. Um, to welcome everybody into um, the session uh, that we that we have today, um, it's called Dynamic Asia, uh, the world's uh, new center for growth. Um, we um, a couple of our panelists have uh, have yet to join. I got a message; one is having some technical difficulties, but I'm delighted to welcome two two of our panelists who have arrived. Uh, Alan Alan Lau, who's the president of Anglo Euro Energy Indonesia. Um, although he's currently um, calling in from Singapore, and Ravi Chinambaram, who is the president and co-founder of TC Capital, uh, who is based and who is also calling in from, from Singapore. So um, we, we have, um, hopefully, uh, joining us still is uh, Jayanta Padar, uh, who's the chairman and managing director of Dekarazi Paints and Coatings in India, and Melkor Plabasan, the Director of the Technology Risk and Innovation Department at the Central Bank of the Philippines. Um, but let's get started um, with, uh, with, with Alan and Ravi, and thank you both for joining. Um, we had discussed uh, earlier that we will spend a few minutes um, for the panelists to make a few opening remarks, and then we're going to go uh, into, um, into a, into a Q&A period. Uh, which will depend a little bit on um, how many panelists we have. You know, some of the questions that we are looking to address um, is, is around trade, um, <clears throat> including the recently signed uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP agreement. Um, uh, any what, what the business community thinks about implementation challenges for RCEP and, and whether RCEP is a sufficiently robust agreement to act as a springboard for structural reforms. And we also want to look at um, what these agreements, both RCEP and the CPTPP, the Revised Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, means for the U.S., which is not in either of these two major uh, Asia uh, regional economic agreements, uh, and how that might impact um, the economic aspects of the U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Um, and, 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 and given the, the theme of this um, uh, conference is, uh, is around um, the U.S. And, and the Biden administration, we're also going to want to touch upon um, how, how can Asian governments and businesses, obviously more businesses on this panel, um, can ensure continued strong engagement uh, by the U.S. and the business sector in particular uh, in Asia. So um, I'm sure we will cover um, other topics as well. There's a great deal to discuss. Um, so, Alan, well, let me turn to you, and um, why don't you take a few minutes to uh, to get us started? Right. Well, good, Daddy. Good evening. Good day, the distinguished speakers, fellow delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am Alan Lau, President Director of Anglo Euro Energy Indonesia. Anglo Euro Energy is an infrastructure project the developer in in natural gas and LNG in new and renewable energy and in carbon capture projects, including methane emission abatements. Uh, we balance our business with social impact projects in low-income housing, utilizing uh, earthquake-resistant structures, as well as in off-grid drinkable water solutions. In contrary to popular opinion, RACEP, the RCEP, was first initiated in 2011 at the 19 ASEAN summit held in Bali. The subsequent year, uh, six nations at, at, at that time, which includes India, China, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, adopted a joint declaration to support RCEP. Of course, we all know that India at the last minute, you know, that they pulled, that they pulled out of the membership. So, well, RCEP, hence, in essence, is a response by ASEAN leaders to a host of previous trade agreements that does not provide for and ensure ASEAN centrality. This then begets the question whether will RCEP be ASEAN-led or will it be China-dominated? So we shall look at all these 
uh, issues. We shall also discuss what are the issues and problems, obstacles in the implementation of RCEP and what other factors for success. <coughs> we, we shall be looking at what will be the new administration, trade policies uh, for Asia, what will be the impact of that, will the CPTPP be revived, what will be the consequences of a uh, a court, a you know this quadrilateral security dialogue uh, formation? Uh, what will that be? The led, what will be the impact of the Indo-Pacific initiatives on the success of the implementation of the RCEP? Thank you, Alan. Thank you for that, and uh, we look forward to kind of getting back into that topic uh, in the, in the Q and A. Um, Robbie, let me now loud turn it to you and. Um, Ask for your perspective on some of these some of these questions. Sure, uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, so let me let me start with uh, some background on me. I'm Ravi Chidambaram. I'm uh, president and uh, co-founder of TC Capital. It's a Singapore-based investment banking group. We have two arms to our business. Uh, one is uh, an investment banking firm that is active in the capital markets and M and A. Uh, the other is we have um, an in-house. Uh, venture arm, uh, and we've started up three fintech companies, one in the area of KYC due diligence, one in the area of sustainability, and one in the area of corporate finance and trading. Um, so based on sort of my world and what I'm observing, and, you know, the name of the panel, uh, Dynamic Asia, you know, the world's new center of growth, let me just throw out some observations. Um, number one, it's very fair to say that all the Asian economies, for the most part, are recovering quite well from COVID and therefore uh, right now are ahead of the global game in terms of restarting the engines and triggering growth. We've seen a huge comeback in consumption in the ASEAN markets uh, as well as in China uh, and India to some extent. Uh, and you know, there's no question that the GDP growth rate figures for this year for the most part for the region will be probably the best out of any region in the world. Number two, um, it's very interesting in the tech world to see a very different tech ecosystem evolving in Asia, one that does not rely anymore on the U.S., uh, one that's based very much on its own types of rules, um, its own innovation. I think that has some very interesting implications uh, for the U.S. and the global tech giants in the U.S., but certainly China is leading the way, but ASEAN is also becoming a very dynamic region. Uh, for, for tech. The third uh, are capital flows. I think we're seeing less and less dependence on Western capital inflows into Asia to fuel Asian growth. Uh, I have never seen so much liquidity in the major Asian capital markets than, than now. Uh, it's uh, realistic to say that almost any project of any size or any company uh, can be funded quite easily with the liquidity in the region. So that also has some very profound implications for the global capital markets and a potential decoupling. Arguably, Asia is now the greatest source of liquidity and is a net capital exporter to other regions right now. So uh, these are all very interesting trends. Uh, I know we want to touch on the implications for the U.S., but I think all these trends have profound implications for the U.S. Robbie, let me just follow up on, on a couple of those those points you made to kind of <clears throat> kick us off a little bit. Let me let me actually start in <clears throat> in uh, in reverse order. Um, China has recently um, liberalized its its financial markets to a certain degree, and that has opened up sort of the fl some floodgates of capital flowing in into China in particular. Um, has that been too? Would you say? Um, to, to the detriment or to the advantage of the large U.S. capital market players? Well, you know, as, as you know, uh, Hong Kong, for example, is the biggest uh, IPO center in the world, has been for the past few years. Uh, there's no question that Shanghai and Shenzhen, while not fully internationalized and convertible, I think have ambitions to, to be like that. Uh, so in that sense, Hong Kong has already eclipsed London and New York as the equity capital market. It is now probably the most dynamic and fast growing equity capital market in the world. Uh, that cannot be yet said for the debt markets, uh, but uh, it's heading that way. 
So it's fair to say that China in the next five, 10 years could eclipse the U.S. as the world's biggest capital market center and biggest pool. Yes. Okay. Um, and, um, and I want to go to some of your other arguments, but let's, let's stick on capital markets for a second. Um, you know, uh, over the last year, there's, there's been, um, particularly in the U S but not only in the U S, um, a lot of concerns raised about whether Hong Kong is going to be able to maintain that role as a capital market center, given the crackdown on, um, on, on, on the protests on, on sort of the democratic rights on, on the ledge co, uh, et cetera. And that does not yet seem to be the case. The, 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 the capital markets seem to be doing just fine, as, as, as far as I can tell. Although, you know, I, that's not my, it's not my industry. Um, what's what's your what's your take on that? Is that um, despite what's happening in the political field, uh, are the the rules and regulations that that, that shape the capital markets, uh, contract sanctity, deliver, deliverability, that kind of thing? Are those are do the do capital market players still have confidence in those? Um, well, I think there are two levels here, right? I think one is, would global investors, particularly Western investors, continue to invest in Hong Kong? Because obviously a big part of the trade flow into Hong Kong, the capital markets flows come from large global funds like Fidelity, BlackRock, and so on. So on one level, um, because most of the stocks to invest in in Hong Kong are Chinese stocks, you know, you have to ask yourself, would those types of funds boycott Chinese stocks because of concerns around data privacy, uh, the way they treat uh, Uyghurs, uh, you know, labor policies and other geopolitical issues. So that is a separate issue, right? But my guess is it's unlikely to be a blanket boycott, but rather a selective boycott where certain companies that may be linked to the state that may be engaged in practices that are perceived as perhaps, you know, not, of international standard or in compliance with norms, maybe they would be boycotted. But the reality is I cannot see the Hong Kong stock market losing its fungibility and credibility for Western investors because it's such a crucial market and China is such a crucial part market now, uh, part of any portfolio, really, right? Moreover, a lot of Asian investors don't share those concerns. So they will continue to trade anyway in Hong Kong and other Asian markets. They have a very different perspective. Uh, Of course, you know, BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, and so on, they do control 30% of the global equities in the world. So if they were to pull out of Hong Kong, it would have significance, but I don't think they would do a blanket pullout, right? You have seen, of course, uh, at least in the Trump administration, uh, you know, some Chinese stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, that were delisted, you know, or banned from trading. Um, even that was watered down. But the reality is, I think some of these companies are too big, probably, to be completely boycotted, even by Western investors. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I want to. I want to uh, come back to um, some of the points you made on technology, but let's. But let's. Let's stick with um, capital and, and and money for the time being. Alan, one of the issues that that you were talking about a bit earlier was you know, kind of the, the, the likely imminent increased use of digital currencies, uh, particularly by China, e yuan, um, e renminbi, um, forcing, you know, some of the, the monthly developed banks, IMF included, to now think about ESDRs and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, recognizing it's it's still fairly early days in that in that process. What how do you see that impacting um business, uh, foreign business in, in Asia. Um, and and um, to the extent that you, you have a view on, on how this affects the, the U.S.-China relationship, uh, you know, I'm sure our, our viewers would be interested to hear that as well. Right. As you know that this year, China introduced the e yuan or the e renminbi I shall use these terms inter- interchangeably. The objective of the e yuan is to be the dominant global trade currency to be utilized in financial payment and settlements as an alternative to the SWIFT, as well as to be used in major trade contracts and to be the leading world reserve currency in the IMF basket of currencies. Whether this can be achieved, in my mind, rests on three economic realities. Number one, 
the strength of the Chinese economy. As you know, even the Chinese economy has been resilient, even at times of the pandemic. The forecast this year for 2021 is at 6% on a year-to-year -year basis. The World Bank estimate is higher at 7%. The growing middle income group of reflects a increasing demand and consumption along with the addition of the hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens that has been elevated from the poverty line it gives a sustainable growth henceforth growth in China is long term and sustainable point number two the Belt Road Initiative that covers 68 countries representing 65% of the world population with 40% of the global GDP in, normal, in the nominal terms. This is a widespread base. It's a widespread economic base that sets the foundation for the adoption of the EUN. Point number three is the global debt structure. China is a major lender to the world. According to the Kiel Institute of Germany, China, 50 countries, 50 developing countries, host China 1.5 trillion, which reflects 20 to 30 percent of their national GDP. In addition, China holds 1.1 trillion in U.S. Treasury and 3 trillion in forex reserve. And I'm not even mentioning about the unallocated reserve, which means those currencies that are not in the IMF uh, basket of currencies that the debtor countries owes to China, which actually has been estimated at a figure of about $5 trillion. So it is enormous, you know. So China is the largest lender in the world. What does that mean is that these debtor, with the advent of the EUN, it allows for the debtor countries to pack their currency to the digital currency of China. The People's Bank of China, which is the central bank, <coughs> the actual rate. Now this will allow for a seamless transfer of debt held in US dollar into the EU. Now these three economic realities, plus the fact if RCEP is successful in its implementation and the adoption of the RCEP, that, that is a fourth factor. So this itself will set the scene for China to be the, the for the EU to be the major currency in world trade and and in the world reserve currency. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, that, uh, that process and uh, the way you've described it, it's uh, it's happening qu more quickly than I than I than I was aware. Um, but I can certainly see how um, to, to take that a step further. Um, that poses a considerable uh, risk or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, as the, you know, as the U.S. U.S. dollar's role as the as the principal reserve currency, um, which is, which itself would have you know pretty pretty significant geopolitical uh, implications. Um, so let's, um, uh, Robert, let's go let's go back to you and and and, and switch topics a little bit to uh, technology, um, which you, you you mentioned a little bit in your in your opening remarks. Um, you made the point that um, Asia in general is 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 less is is the, the trend is that it's becoming less dependent on the U.S. for technology generally, and, and I, I assume you would also include uh, technological innovation. Uh, in, in that um, now, there's uh, there's a, there's a, there's a common view uh, in U.S. political discourse that's a little bit different from that. Um, I think there's an awareness that um, you know China has made huge strides um, in in a number of technological areas, and and, and in some of them, um, it's probably already ahead um, in, in certain elements of AI and. Um, autonomous vehicles, uh, among others. Um, but there's a general view that in particular in sort of in, in the key area of semiconductors that the U.S. still has a considerable lead. And, and just because of the ubiquitous and, and very important role of semiconductors, that that still represents a, you know, a, a particular vulnerability to the, to the China economic story, and argu arguably the biggest vulnerability in the China economic story. Um, what do you what do you make of that narrative? Do you do you do you agree with it? Do you think it's partly right, 
completely right? Missing the mark? What do you what's what's your thought on that? No, I think you're right, uh, Adam. That there's no question that in chip technology, the U.S. is the global leader. China is desperately trying to catch up. There's no question. You probably saw recently they even poached a lot of high level talent from Taiwan. Um, you know, which is probably in Asia um, the only match for the U.S. Uh, so in that sense, um, China is trying to catch up. And of course, that was the center of the Huawei dispute as well. It's really around the chip technology. Um, but, you know, uh, you really can't underestimate China in its capacity to catch up even in these areas. I think the interesting thing about China is it's developed behind sort of its own barriers, its own tech ecosystem, um, you know, in all kinds of areas. And what they do is they spend a lot of money, they experiment, they have a big domestic market, they sort of get it right, and then they figure out how to go global, right? That's the story of companies like Huawei, uh, where, you know, they repackaged effectively technology from people like Northern Telecom, Ericsson, people like that. And, uh, you know, they figured out how to build low cost mobile networks um, and fiber optic networks. And, and they took that out. Similarly, in, in Semicon, um, a lot of research and money is going into that in China and they will test it out behind closed doors. They will force a lot of companies to adopt the technology until they come, come up the curve. And, you know, who knows? They, they may be able to take on the U.S. or at least reduce dependence on the U.S. in chip technology. I think that's we've seen this story before in other areas as well, uh, mobile phones, uh, almost any area of electronics. Um, so I think that trend will continue, but it won't happen that quickly. But, you know, I think over time it will happen. I don't think the U.S. can be complacent about its leadership in chip technology. And, and just sort of a, a related topic to that, and again, one that gets a <coughs> excuse me, a lot of conversation in the U.S. is, is, is around standards. Now, the standards issue is broader than just tech, but since we're talking about tech, let's just kind of focus on, on, on in, the, in the tech areas. And, and the concern is, as you know, that we're that the world could be migrating to kind of parallel. Um, you know, set standard sets or, or, or approaches a standard, which among other things would be economically inefficient, right? And it, and, you know, it, it would reduce the, the benefit of, of production at scale uh, um, among other inefficiencies, um, as we have seen in the past when, when standards don't, don't align well. Um, let's, let's sort of posit a world and where, and where that, ha that starts to happen. Um, Cause you know, which in, in good scenario planning style, what, what do you, where do you think that goes? Uh, how does, you know, I think there's a, again, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a sense in the, in the U S dialogue that because, because the, because of the belief that the U S has a t still, still retains um, a technological lead that, um, that, that China would be more disadvantaged than the U S you know, in that world. Do you, do you share that view? No, I don't. I, I think we're going to go to this goes to the heart of, of the trade issue, really. I think this is no longer than about technological leadership. You're right. It's about standards. It's about perception around data privacy, security um, and so on. Right. So I think a lot of Chinese companies have come to accept that they probably will not be able to sell in a big way in the U.S. Uh, you know, I think what they're counting on is the massive growth of Asia and to be the preferred tech supplier to most Asian countries. I think that's their goal. And I think that, you know, they're preparing for that. They certainly need to uh, look at some of the cutting edge technologies in the U.S. and uh, get up to speed, like we gave the example of chips. But I think that is China's vision. I think they realize in the short term they won't be able to compete. I think a lot of American tech companies are feeling the same way about their prospects in China anyway. The, the regions that are up for grabs are regions like ASEAN or India, right? You know, um, will they be receptive to Chinese technology? Will they also start to share some of the concerns that we've seen in the US and Europe? Europe itself is also a little bit up for grabs. Can the Chinese succeed there? Or again, you know, will there be more of a unified front with the US um, where they crack down? So I see, this at the core of future competitiveness, trade policy, um, and in some ways, even 
uh, philosophical and political beliefs, right? You know, right. because all of this goes into uh, every aspect of our lives now. So, right. yeah. So let's let me look, open this up to, to both of you because that, that's it's, it's a very it's such an interesting question about. I mean, obviously, there's a great number of geopolitical variables, and you know, um, is the U.S. going to be successful in, in in sort of rebuilding alliances to uh, take a harder line on 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 Chinese technology, generally speaking, but also sort of you know on on you know the, the the US being the kind of the primary writer of 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 standards you know authorship so to speak um so let's bring this back to the trade question and and since we started with RCEP um does 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 you know and, and Alan I take I take your point that like a lot of the reporting has has been a bit uh, incorrect and a bit unfair to ASEAN and sort of describing RCEP as a, as as a, as a Chinese creation as it kind of started started life in ASEAN but Leaving, leaving the history aside, does membership in RCEP provide China some protection from that? Um, you know, with uh, in, in terms of uh, being able to 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 sell its technology uh, among the RCEP member countries, which which of course you know represents some thirty percent of global GDP. So it's not a it's not a small grouping. Alan, why don't you take a first crack at that? Yeah, having ASEAN centrality will actually act as a cohesive factor to bring in countries like Japan, Australia, into uh, Vietnam. So it actually does uh, make it as a cohesive force in trade. Uh, now, of course, there are present trade con conflicts between Australia and China, as we all know. So. Involving ASEAN, I think, will be a good initiative, but ultimately it will be China-dominated. It, it will be ASEAN-initiated, but it will be China-led. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, um, the effectiveness, there, 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 there have been previous trade you know, policies, right? You have the AFTA, you have the, the ASEAN, you have the, uh, the, the comprehensive the economic partnership for East Asia, which is initiated by Japan, so you have, and of course you have the, the, the TPP. So this host of uh, free trade, and some of them don't even have the that don't even have the desired outcome. Uh, so henceforth, this begets the question: What will be the impact of the RCEP implementation? I know right now they go out at going through a rectification process. Indonesia, for example, have left out three items, which they say, look, this is our, <laughs> you know that we are not going to negotiate on that, which is the weaponry, the rice, because of the smallholders in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so these are the, the uh, each countries actually can, so this rectification, rectification process, it is now going for the implementation. Okay, good. Yeah. So, good. So, so each country, in short, the message is each country will move on what are their own internal pri that priorities, okay. even though this is a regional trade agreement. And, and Ravi, um, I'm interested in your take on this as well. So, you know, RCEP is one example, the investment uh, agreement that China signed with Europe um, just before the Biden administration took office uh, is another example. Um, as you know, China is, is also considering uh, applying to uh, accede to the CPTPP. Um, so the question is, 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 is in your view, and you know, trade trade economists seem to disagree on this. To what extent is membership in these um, multilateral trade agreements help or, or protection against some of these forces we were talking about earlier, which is to say, um, political efforts to to well, I guess in this case led led by the U.S. to kind of contain or push back against Chinese technological leadership. Yeah, I think, you know, for China, these types of initiatives are viewed as a, a counterbalance to that. It, it gives them more regional and global credibility to be parts of these groupings uh, and to be, as Alan said, you know, in a way, kind of the leader of these groupings. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, as you know, China is highly sensitive about being the preeminent power in the Asia-Pac region. So I think that they will um, negotiate many of these types of regional partnerships. I mean, even Belt and Road, you know, to some extent was really initiated on that front. So uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, very, it's a very important part of Chinese policy. 
it also reflects the reality in this region. You know, if you live in ASEAN, the reality is China is your biggest trading partner uh, for every ASEAN member. Um, Uh, almost any aspect of tech, you will see that sort of linkage already. So, I mean, that is the reality. And these agreements will then just cement that and expand that that concept. I agree with Alan. There, there's <coughs> it looks like we um, might have, we might have lost Ravi there. <laughs> At least he's he's disappeared from um, from my screen. Ravi, are you are you still with us? Yes, we're just having a discussion on on tech. Yes. Are you okay? Um, so, um, hi, Jayanta Podar. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks for joining. We're. Um, we're nearing the end, the end of our session. Um, unfortunately, you've, you've just come in as, as another panelist has, I think, just had some tech tech issues and, and dropped out. So we're um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll 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 get him back shortly. Um, we, we were just uh, actually, you know, uh, we were just talking about. Um, Sorry about that, gentlemen. I got kicked out of the call for some reason. I'm back. Well, you're back. Do you, do you want to do you want to just. Finish, finish your. Am I, am, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Am I late? I thought that our session is uh, started at uh, you know IST at uh, seven twenty a.m. It's not. Uh, well, it started. It started about a half an hour ago, and we. Oh, have, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I missed that first half an hour. Yep. We have seven minutes left. So uh, we're anyway. We're just we're just having a conversation about capital capital markets and technology. Um, let me let me. We haven't actually. The, one of the original intents of this panel was talking about trade and we haven't really talked about it that much, but let me, let me ask a, a question. I'm happy for anybody to sort of take this on. So again, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the, the reality is there are now two major trade agreements um, that are centered around the, the Asia PAC region. One is the CPTPP and the other is RCEP. And both account for some 30% of, of global GDP. They're very, they're very major groupings. They're, they're, in other ways, different agreements, but they um, they're both they're both they're both quite significant in, in their scale. And the U.S. is not in, in either one of them. So the question for uh, and I'd be interested in from you know, you come from different um, perspectives and from an industry point of view, what what that actually means for U.S. business. Uh, and, and, you know, they're to Joe. Government, government, but in the end of the day, you know, businesses do business, and it's 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 a more project based uh, arrangement, at least on the investment side. And and U.S. companies can still be very competitive and, and active in Asia. And and the fact that, and, and the U.S. the U.S. as a country as a government's absence from these two trade agreements is unfortunate, but not but not highly damaging. What um, I'd be interested in in in, in the in the panel's uh, view on where, where which one of those answers you are you closer to, um, Alan? Why don't you why don't you go first? No, I I will let you know, <coughs> squeeze just join just. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, that's probably fair <laughs> enough. You, you probably were thrown quite into the deep end there, but why don't you, uh, what's what's your thought on that question? Jayanta, are you? Um, yeah. Okay. You, uh, question is to me, uh, Adam. The question, the question is to yeah. you. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just, and just bear in mind. Just, I just wanted that we, we bear in mind. We've we've got five minutes left, so maybe just take a take a minute. We can get everybody to, to yeah, have a view okay. on that question. Okay. Uh, so uh, I really don't think it's a threat to US because uh, though this uh, RCEP is uh, you know apparently theoretically on paper looks great. But uh, my take is that uh, whether it is sustainable, in my view, uh, personal view, it is not sustainable uh, because everything depends on the geopolitical uh, factors. 
And now within this uh, countries, the 15 countries, uh, there are a lot of issues, you know, between China, Japan, China, Australia, you know, China, Philippines, you know, every time there are a lot of issues cropping up. So it is really difficult, you know, it's it, it we have to be uh, patient, we have to see, uh, you know, what is going to happen. But uh, I really don't think it's a, it's a it's a real threat. Just for an example, if it is a threat also, if tomorrow US uh, wants to rejoin CPTPP, as we say that RCEP is controlling 30% of world GDP. Now, if tomorrow uh, US joins back to TPCPP, they will be controlling 40% of world GDP. Right. In fact, if you see in 2018, there is an agreement between European Union and Japan. You know, that controls itself is a 25% of GDP, but nobody talks about that. So, so it's all on paper and sustainability is the main issue so far as, uh, you know, so far as, uh, you know, you know, my thinking is concerned. So but we have to wait and watch. It's too early to say that. And with the new uh, US administration, definitely they will take a call on that. So far as joining back on TPCPP or not. So, so let's wait for some time. It's too early to say, too early to comment. Very good. Thank you. Um, Ravi? Yeah, I think from a, a U.S. business perspective, uh, there won't be any short-term damage of uh, you know the U.S. not being uh, in RCEP uh, and so on. I think a lot of the major U.S. multinationals are very well established in the region. Uh, they have their channels. They'll continue to trade. They'll continue to, to do well. However, I think from a longer term geopolitical strategic perspective, if uh, the U.S. still views itself as a power in Asia uh, beyond in, in military sense, then I think you know, they will have to get involved in these regional forums because, you know, this is where a lot of things like standards, policies uh, and so on will be decided. And I think, of course, uh, I think a lot of people would welcome uh, more U.S. engagement, really. So that, that's my take. Good. And, and Alan, last word for you. Right. OK. I see that, uh, in fact, U.S. can be proactive as well because Singapore, London, uh, Canada, I think, has been this appointed as centers to trade in the EU and in the you know, digital country. So in the currency. So U.S., I mean, their presence is already here. They're here in Asia. So they can catalyze on all these trends and being such a great financial center of the world. This is just another added factor. So, you know, in fact, they can even benefit if they were to position themselves in a mode of cooperation rather than conflict. Very good. I think just to take take a take a moderator privilege, I I, I, I agree with that. I'm I'm sort of of the view that um, that business goes ahead. The U.S. business is still quite competitive. I think there's, but I, but I, but Robbie, I, I, I don't disagree with your point that over the longer term, you know, um, having having a seat at the table where where, where standards um, are being set is is critically important. Um, and well, you know, I think I think there's a general consensus among the business community that the Biden administration can find its way, can navigate the politics at home. Uh, to find its way back into 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 multilateral trade agreements and and sort of get out of the habit of doing everything on a bilateral basis, which is not so much economically you know inefficient, but it, it frankly it just takes a long time, <laughs> and the world is moving uh, at a rapid really pace. So anyway, thank you, um, Jayant. Sorry, sorry about the the. the no, I'm the, so sorry. I know. I I uh, just miscalculated the time. You know, I'm extremely. No Alan, I, thought, I thought it was a very interesting discussion. We, I think we covered quite a lot of ground in a short period of time. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time and joining the panel. And I, I, wish, I wish you all a good day. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Thank you, Ravi. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye.